of the hour. And so I think we'll get going here. Uh, thank you all for coming to uh, another episode of Mission Beyond COVID. Uh, this is focusing on COVID-19 and the health of communities. Uh, my name is Dr. David Scott. I'm a mission theologian with Global Ministries, uh, and it's good to be with you this morning. A couple of quick notes uh, before we get going here. Uh, this uh, this uh, webisode is being recorded, uh, so please know that. Um, we'll be having a conversation with our panelists this morning. Uh, if there are questions or comments that, that you would like to pass along, please do so in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat, uh, but we ask that you keep your microphones uh, muted for uh, the duration um, so as uh, not to interrupt or, or add additional uh, noise to this. Um, I can't promise we'll get to all of the questions in the chat, but I will be, I will be monitoring that and, uh, and as we go on. Uh, so without further ado, I'd uh, like to introduce our panelists this morning. I'm, I'm very excited at our three guests here. Uh, we have Tatenda Mujani, uh, who is Imagine No Malaria Program Manager for Global Ministries. Dr. Tende, Tendai Manyeza, uh, who's a missionary doctor serving at the UMC Hospital in Kisi, Sierra Leone. And Dr. Caitlin Hansen, Director of Operations for Community Development for All People in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so welcome to all three of you, and it's good to have you with us this morning. Thank you. So our topic this morning is, is COVID-19 and the health of communities. Uh, let me ask, uh, start then by asking, uh, what does a healthy community look like uh, for each of you? Um, I can start. So good morning, everybody. It's great to see your lovely faces today. Um, and I am going to talk on the end of global health. So in the public health sphere and the healthy community. And right now we all know about our abundant health initiative. Uh, a healthy community is a community that has all these three aspects of health we've been talking about, which is mind, body, and spirit. So mental health, mm -hmm. physical health, and spiritual health. And that means for the mental health, we know it's just like your mental well-being, um, free from stress or stressors or all these other things that might affect us, our mental well-being at any given time. And our physical health is what we know in a, in a general, just how we are feeling on a regular basis. So having our the health care that we need to make sure we're free from disease, we're free from um, from any um, um, any affliction that might be affecting us. So um, in, in many areas, it's um, linkage to preventative care, to essential health services, a safe delivery for mothers who want to have children, that's what physical health will be. And spiritual health is what uh, Dr. David Scott and many of our spiritual leaders have here, that being grounded, meditating, having God in that aspect is very important. So that's what a healthy community wants, that can have all these three aspects in it. I mean. Yeah, I would second that, and it's one of the reasons why the notion of abundant health resonates so much for us here at uh, United Methodist Church for All People and Community Development for All People. It is this notion of thriving, not simply surviving. Um, it means the full justice and shalom of uh, racial equity, economic equity, cl climate justice. Um, that it's not just making it to the next day, but but living life and having that life abundant. You know, everyone wants to live a long time. No one wants to be sick. Uh, everyone wants to give good food to their kids. And really, it is that goal of health, wholeness, and wellness that can draw draw us together in mutuality. Those those mutual goals that we have. I mean, a wise man once said, "Who among you would give a rock if your child asks for bread?" Um, and it turns out that's pretty us universally true. Dr. Menyeza, uh, how do those definitions of healthy communities resonate with you? Thank you very much. Um, well, let me start by saying WHO defines health as a state of physical uh, mental and 
social well-being and not just the, not just the absence of disease. So what it means is, uh, in as much as our, health, our communities may not have the disease per se, uh, they are being affected in a very, very, very negative way by this COVID-19. Their physical health is being affected. Their mental health is being affected. And also their social and economic health are being affected. And when you know there's, like what Tatenda has said, there's connection between the physical, uh, spiritual, uh, uh, mental. So any, any effect on each one of those will affect the other. So the total, the total well-being of the human being is affected that way. So it, it has Im negative impacts on the outputs in all areas of their lives. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really uh, appreciate that because we're operating with this broader holistic um, understanding of health that the impacts of the, the pandemic go far beyond the physical impacts. I, I'm, for all three of you, what sort of ways have you seen the pandemic impacting or, or threatening the health of c communities that you're connected with uh, through your work? I can um, talk about, so working in the Global Health Unit, we work with global communities and our partners, um, mostly in Africa, but throughout the world. And um, there, so COVID is not just threatening, like uh, Dr. Maniza says this, it cannot, you might not live with COVID, but it affects your health in other ways or in, in, in how it's like, it's all connected. Um, one specific area that we've been challenged with is not necessarily COVID, but how COVID has affected um, essential health services, uh, where we provide okay. essential health services. Um, so, Public health has made many advancements over the years in providing, for instance, preventative care, vaccinations, making sure mothers have safe births, um, prevention from malaria and all that. But with COVID in the community and in our facilities, firstly, in our governments that we work in, there was uh, resources mm -hmm. taken away from these areas that we want to work in. In many areas with doctors them themselves, the human resources, sometimes financial resources having to be diverted. We're talking in the malaria sphere, even those malaria commodities that we need to be sending to our, our communities. In many areas, the governments have to juggle on what is most important right now when they need it to be providing PPE and all these other devices needed in the facilities for COVID response. So there's been diversion of resources from, um, from all these services that has broken um, essential services. In many cases, people are afraid to go to the facility because of um, fear of COVID or, and or similar symptoms. Uh, I'll talk about malaria, for instance. Malaria says if you've got a fever, you need to seek healthcare within 24 hours of this fever. However, when you have fever is also one of the many um, uh, conditions that are associated with COVID. So there was fear of attending in this facility. So we've got in many cases, like in Zimbabwe for now, we've got higher incidences of um, malaria. So more malaria cases and more malaria deaths than COVID right now, because there's these gaps that are there. They can't deliver mosquito nets. Women are not getting their vaccinations. So blockage, it's, it's affecting the essential health services in the community. So health in that, in that aspect. Um, and also mentally, and I can talk about it. I think this is another topic about um, one comment that we had. We just were asking our health boards and our communities and the hospitals we work in, what are some of the things that people are dealing with is um, being in a hospital by yourself and or when a loved one has passed away, not being able to mourn, not being able to gather, not being able to go to church and meet with everybody else. So mentally, people are drained. Economically, people are drained because they don't have sources of income. So it's affected in so many ways, but I guess the greatest for us is that blockage in essential services and what it's going to mean for all the advances we've made in public health in the past 10, 20 years um, with these relentless diseases that we work with on a regular basis. And, and Dr. Manuza, I, I saw you nodding along as, uh, as, as Tenda was talking about, you know, this diversion of resources and blockage of, re uh, have you seen this in Kissy Hospital? Um, not at the moment in Kisi Hospital, uh, but there are reports almost everywhere. I mean, in, in, in a lot of countries like Zimbabwe, uh, in South Africa itself, 
uh, there are reports of uh, unemployment mm. rates going up very, 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 very much. So much so that it, it, has had neg it has impacted negatively on the food supply, on the school uh, uh, parents being able to send their children to school and uh, nutrition. So it, it, that way, it has actually presented uh, stressful situations for parents, which has resulted in uh, mental health problems. So coming back to your question, yes, I, I mean, uh, uh, there has been diversion of resources in a lot of countries. Uh, right now here in Sierra Leone, that we don't have those reports as, as it now, but in Zimbabwe, because of food nu uh, uh, nutritional problems, you find that in the scarcity of the resources, you find that they have to channel towards buying of food. Mm. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of para-COVID effects. Wow. Um, I can't, to my knowledge, no one in our congregation uh, themselves have contracted COVID-19. And yet, of course, every single member of our congregation um, has been affected by the para effects. Um, United Methodist Church for All People is about half white, half black, and 60% at or below the poverty line, with the other 40% being middle and upper class folks. So we're fairly diverse for a church in the United States across both race and class. And one of, the, we've noticed a couple of trends. One, in the United States, there's been a big shift, I'm sure as elsewhere, uh, into attempting more digital interactions, more online, more Zoom. And that's become a huge barrier for our community. We know mm -hmm. that it has always been uh, a disparity, internet access, and this season has really brought that to light. And so we have uh, begun to really advocate strongly for broadband internet being considered a social determinant of health uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that um, housing is transportation education because right now um, a lot of folks their only way to access a medical physician is through the internet the only way to access a mental health professional is through the internet uh, for a lot of people the only way to work at their job is through the internet so it's affecting income um, and uh, or even to get a job is through the internet and so many of our students are dependent on the internet for for their education. Students that were already struggling to get access to equitable education are now finding themselves with even more barriers. So we are uh, actively working to provide the families that we work with directly with both um, Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots so that they can access uh, their, their education and their teachers' work. We are in process of making our church building a mobile hotspot so that folks outdoors can come uh, and access the internet. And then we're using that to uh, leverage some advocacy on a citywide level. What would it mean to make uh, broadband internet a public utility and think about it the same way that we think about it as gas and electricity? Um, because it does matter for folks' lives. Um, the other thing I would note um, in our context with, with education. And I do not envy the folks in the decision-making seats for, for schools and whether to come back together or not. Um, and, you know, the catchphrase around here is, you know, stay home, stay safe. And the question I just raised is what if home is not safe? And so for so many of our kids, um, home doesn't necessarily have food home um, isn't necessarily safe for your body whether that's physical abuse sexual abuse whether it's just having heat for the winter um, so for many of us yes we stay home to stay safe but what if home is not safe um, and then the last thing i would i would say that i do just have to acknowledge that you know, through this whole season, I do credit our hard living folks for one more time in our community being the agents of hope, um, being the face of Christ to me. Um, you know, our, our congregation is pretty mixed across class. Um, and I have to say, 
some of our middle and upper class folks um, were truly struck with a deep fear um, in the depths of you know, March and April, and rightly so, you know, I right along with them. Um, and yet it was our hard living folks that, that one more time reminded us, you know, God's gotten us through some really tough stuff. And God's going to get us through this as well. It was our hard living folks that reminded us, like, you know, I've, I've always had jobs that I was scared would suddenly go away. I've never been secure in life. Uh, you know, I've made plans that have been suddenly canceled for things outside of my control. This is what I've lived, and I know God's been with me through that. Um, and that's was a beautiful witness to our middle and upper class folks who were watching the stock market and getting scared or used to commuting on the highway with their cars and suddenly seeing no one else uh, on the highway. It was our hard living folks that that cast that vision of, of Christ's hope and health for all of us. I, I really appreciate those examples. One of this very programmatic uh, response by the church to the challenges posed by the pandemic of trying to uh, create greater internet access. And one, this very theological response uh, of this witness to God as, uh, you know, provider and sustainer and, and healer who will move us through this. Um, for, for all three of you, are there other uh, examples or, or other roles that the church has in promoting healthy communities, especially in the face of the pandemic? Definitely. Um, so when we started with, uh, when the Global Health Unit, the Global Ministry started off with COVID-19 um, training, um, we, we started with um, our health board workers uh, who are working in our health facilities and going into the communities but the most important group of people that was being trained were clergy um, and health uh, and, and, and religious leaders. Why? Because they are so influential um, in, in, in disease, in advocacy and disease prevention. Um, in many times we're trying to think of how are we going to spread the word? And the most important ways in many cases is our leaders. And we started saying with even our bishops in, in conversations I can talk about. Um, they say uh, Bishop uh, Unda in, in East Congo, for instance, before anything in his sermons are surrounded, he in, involves COVID-19, involves social distancing. Um, our, our church leaders in continuously to speak and talk about basically, that's what we're talking about, social distancing, wearing masks and, and just general um, hand hygiene. It starts from the leadership in that prevention me measures. But also it's not only for prevention because they, they're saying it continuously on WhatsApp, on videos and Facebook Live, but it's also how we are relying on our leaders for psychosocial support for our congregations. For, like I said, there's people who are having to go with dealing with the disease and grieving alone in their homes. Um, in, in my community here in Atlanta, Georgia, we're, we're called, we had a call, just calling people. And there's so many people who are isolated and alone in the home. So our leaders had that role or our church had that role of calling people and saying, how are you okay? And for some people that was what they needed because they just felt alone and isolated. Um, and Caitlin talked about just home not being safe. And in the areas we work in, um, home is not safe for so many women and, and, and girls and young children, but women, gender-based violence has escalated. So our religious leaders also have that, that to, to, it's not something that we typically address, I think, as religious leaders, but then to be able to address, even in church sermons, in, in the messaging on um, gender-based violence and addressing those, that on a, set, on, a, on a regular basis. And it's difficult also when religious leaders are also depending because they're also depending on they don't have food in their homes what do we do on that end so it's just been it's just been a juggle of all but our our religious leaders and going through communicating health and what health looks like both physical and um, mental and spiritual through our religious community has been very important another area which i think the church should come in in a very big way is managing the information about covid uh, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation right from the way, from inception, from the time that COVID came. And you know, when people, when there's misinformation, people tend to take the wrong advices. So 
uh, we, as churches, we need to continue giving more and more information, updating updated information, reliable information, riding on the, uh, the, the, the social networking uh, facilities that they have, like the newsletters and the bulletins or even the Facebooks. Uh, right now, is, you know, this misinformation started even from the time the virus came, was, was discovered. People did not know about it. Uh, the only medical personnel were discovering it as they were going, uh, the effects and influence as they were going through it. And now we are on the other extreme where we are talking about the, the, the treatments as well as the vaccines. And you know, it pro produces a lot of uh, anxieties in people if a lot of information comes from different sources which is not properly managed. So I think we can take advantage of the personnel in our church who are knowledgeable in information management to provide useful information from reliable sources and then uh, give this information through the proper uh, social networks. And you know, the church, our churches are very are in a very privileged position because uh, they've got structures within the church which ensures that the information is relayed to the various age groups, to the various uh, uh, communities in a, a friendly way in a more acceptable way. So we should take advantage of, churches should take actually advantage of that and give information to our communities. And I think this is a very important thing which we need to do uh, over and above what uh, issues of gender-based violence, issues of nutrition, issues of uh, uh, managing stress, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I just appreciate what uh, Dr. Meneza says because at the at our best, the church um, corners the market on trust and relationships. That's our currency. That's what we trade on. Um, and we're not always at our best, but when we are, it it is us that has those deep relationships in the community, um, building that trust, building that authentic um, mutual relationship with each other. And so there's never been a better time to be the church, to do what we were created to do, uh, which by the way, from the very beginning was very interlinked with physical health and wellness mm -hmm. from Jesus's ministry to John Wesley's primitive physique, which by the way, was his best-selling work during his time and more than his theology mm -hmm. um, through the legacy of, of the church today. And so, there's never been a better time to reclaim that legacy, particularly in context of the trust and relationships that we were created to have. I, I like that notion of uh, there's never been a better time to be the church. And, and this fits with a, a question that someone submitted through the chat, uh, which is that is COVID creating new opportunities that we did not consider before? Uh, especially creativity, positive changes, and new awarenesses arising from the challenges posed by the pandemic. Oh yes, so uh, for, for us at Church for All People, we're never ones to waste a good crisis. Uh, and from an asset-based perspective, what is the next opportunity? What is the next uh, place where we can grow from simple things like our technology challenged church should probably have been live streaming our services for a long time now and so we finally got our game on with that to to the notion of you know we should be advocating for broadband internet as a public utility it's been a disparity for a long time this has just revealed it um and then also just the tremendous opportunity to be in ministry with our community. You know, GBGM was instrumental through the Abundant Health Initiative in helping us purchase a what used to be a drive-through beer store and turn it into a fresh market that serves over two million pounds of fruits and vegetables uh, each year. And pre-pandemic, we were serving um, almost 400 families a day, and now we're at 600 families a day, making us the largest food pantry in Ohio and in the top 20 in the United States. But what's interesting to us about that is that's among all food pantries giving away any kind of food, canned goods, non-perishables. 
Um, and yet we find there's a tremendous draw to the fresh market where everything we give away is fresh produce. People want to eat healthy. Um, people want good food, but it will always be cheaper and easier to buy a bag of potato chips than a sack of potatoes. If you are driving across town, taking the bus, walking two miles, it will always be cheaper and easier to buy a packet of Kool-Aid than a gallon of milk. And yet we see when the, when everything we offer is fresh produce, we are the most popular of uh, distributor of free food in Ohio. And so it's a lesson to us in this season to really lean into the full opportunity of ministry that God has placed before us. Uh, uh, one of our pa former pastors likes to say, we are, we are faced with insurmountable opportunity uh, if we will only take on, on the challenge and live into everything that is before us. I really appreciate that, Caitlin. And it really has, I think COVID has really have made us think of how, how we do church differently and how, how, what church looks like in this age when people were not able to meet. Um, in some areas, yes, there was opportunities for, for, um, for internet and for, for online um, um, streaming and, and all that, and that has worked. So I, I, I can take it from what I've been going through here in the U.S., and also thinking about our partners and my family, for instance, who are living in Zimbabwe and what does that mean? And for me, what it calls me is just, it's not the church as in the leadership. It's not the, the, um, the people who are in charge of the communications or, or the pastor and everything, but it's every single individual in the church and how we've been called to be a neighbor. What does it mean to be a neighbor? You're stepping out of your comfort zone because yes, for some people, they do have, like I like what you're saying, Caitlin, in your church, there's some who have a lot and some people who are disadvantaged. So what does it mean to be able to give to the other people? What we were encouraging is like when people are at home, we knew, um, like Dr. Magneza, like econom economically people are affected in the areas we're working in. People don't have jobs. And it's not just not having jobs, but people who do not have food, not poor nutrition, not there's absolutely no food. So being a good neighbor, meaning with churches being able to provide food um, packages and, and for those people who are in need, being a good neighbor, as we're saying, is just being there to talk to people, to support them when they need them. So I think um, besides the church and trying to provide and trying to figure out how do we do church, how do we reach people, how do we share the gospel, if church is like talking about their basic needs, um, just like before we go talk, I mean, God is a basic need, but then physical, how am I supposed to worship when, I, when I'm scared, when I'm scared, when I am not safe in where I'm living, when I don't have the food to eat. So it's just not just the church, but what can I do as a good neighbor? How am I, how am I called as a Christian to be a good neighbor? Um, and I think it's something that we're all charged with as we continue going beyond this pandemic. COVID started, people thought, well, maybe it will be over it by the end of the year or so. Now come this time of the year, we are actually seeing cases going up. Indeed, life has to go on. So what it means, we now have to think outside the box. We now have to think about coex, co maybe should I say coexisting with the COVID, mm. living a lifestyle together with this COVID. Mm. And then that way we, we, we continue to live. So in other words, it's, 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 it's producing more opportunity. It, it should give us an opportunity to, to think about more ways of living our lives. And we continue to serve Christ in our different areas. Well, uh, I have certainly been uh, inspired this morning by uh, listening to the, the rich theological reflections from the three of you and uh, the examples of the church uh, being the church and making a difference in the world. Uh, so I would like to, to thank the three of you for being with us. I'll, I'll invite the other attendees to, to show their thanks and, um, and appreciation uh, for those of you uh, who joined late, this um, uh, webinar will be up online within the next day or two on the UM and Global uh, YouTube page. So you can look up UM and Global on YouTube and you should be able to find uh, the link to this. Uh, so thank you again for our panelists, uh, for your words of wisdom this morning. And uh, thank you all who have been in attendance uh, for your uh, attention and for the good work that I know that you all are doing as well. Thank you. Thank you.